In March 2013, the Auditor General released his audit report on carbon neutral government. To read the full report, please visit our website at www.bcauditor.com. The following presentation provides a summary of the report. As the nonpartisan independent auditor of the Legislative Assembly, the Auditor General audits the government reporting entity. This consists of ministries, crown corporations, and other government organizations, such as universities, colleges, school districts, health authorities, and similar organizations that are controlled by or accountable to the provincial government. The Office of the Auditor General serves the people of British Columbia and their elected representatives by conducting independent audits and advising on how well government is managing its responsibilities and resources. Under the Auditor General Act, the Auditor General conducts and reports on both financial audits and performance or value for money audits. The Act also allows the Auditor General to follow up on any recommendations made in reports. Human-induced climate change is seen by many as the largest threat to the global environment today. It is widely attributed to rising levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, primarily due to fossil fuel burning and land clearing activities. In 2007, the province announced it would be taking an aggressive stand to reduce BC's greenhouse gas emissions. A key initiative was the establishment of the carbon neutral public sector commitment. This required public sector organizations to be carbon neutral each year beginning in 2010. Carbon neutrality involves measuring emissions, reducing those emissions where cost effective, and purchasing offsets to balance the remainder therefore achieving net zero emissions. Public sector organizations pay the Pacific Carbon Trust $25 per ton of emissions they generate. In turn, the Pacific Carbon Trust uses these funds to purchase offsets through investments in emission reducing projects. A carbon offset represents a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions generated by activities in one location such as improved energy efficiency, that can be used to compensate for or offset the emissions from another source, such as a plane trip. Essentially, one carbon offset represents the reduction of one ton of carbon dioxide. In 2011, government announced it had achieved its goal of becoming carbon neutral for 2010. The purpose of this audit was to determine whether government achieved its objective of a carbon neutral public sector. To answer this, we asked three questions. Number one, has government established reasonable procedures to allow public sector organizations to determine their greenhouse gas emissions and assessed whether they have taken sufficient actions to reduce those emissions? Number two, has the Pacific Carbon Trust purchased credible offsets? Number three, is government evaluating and reporting on the achievement of its objectives? Our overall conclusion was that the provincial government has not met its objective of achieving a carbon neutral public sector. First, we found that government has established reasonable procedures to determine emissions. However, Government has not established criteria to evaluate whether sufficient actions have been taken to reduce emissions. Secondly, we found the Pacific Carbon Trust has not purchased credible offsets. Lastly, we found that government is reporting on efforts to reduce emissions and its progress in achieving a carbon neutral government. However, the Pacific Carbon Trust has not provided sufficient information about the cost and quality of its purchases. In order to calculate a carbon footprint, each public sector organization needs to determine their greenhouse gas emissions. This includes determining their direct emissions as well as indirect emissions such as electricity consumption and paper use. Core government must also include emissions from business travel. We found that the Climate Action Secretariat has provided reasonable tools and procedures for public sector organizations, as well as training and oversight to help ensure the emissions data recorded is complete and accurate. However, 
While public sector organizations are reporting their emissions and the steps taken to reduce their emissions, the Climate Action Secretariat has not developed criteria to evaluate whether these reduction efforts are sufficient. As well, there is no requirement for government to set emission reduction targets for the public sector. We believe that without clear reduction objectives established by the Climate Action Secretariat, efforts to reduce emissions over time may be limited. Our second question involved determining whether the Pacific Carbon Trust purchased credible offsets. The carbon offset industry is relatively young and the standards are continuously evolving. Given these complexities, our audit focused on two key challenges associated with offset quality. The first is ensuring that the offset projects would not have happened anyway, that is, without the incentive of offsets. Projects must be additional to business as usual, otherwise greenhouse gas emissions have not been reduced. The second is ensuring the offsets are not overstated in their claimed benefit. This involves ensuring baselines are properly determined and are conservative. The baseline is an estimate of the scenario that would reasonably have occurred if the offset project was not undertaken. It is what the project is compared against to determine the quantity of emission reductions. Offsets must also meet BC's emission offsets regulation and be validated and verified by accredited agencies. We expected the Pacific Carbon Trust to ensure the aforementioned risks were mitigated and their offset purchases supported credible projects. We looked at two offset projects purchased by the Pacific Carbon Trust the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Darkwoods Forest Carbon Project, and in Canada's Underbalanced Drilling Project. These represented nearly 70% of the 2010 offset requirements. We found that neither provided credible offsets. Under the Emission Offsets Regulation, projects are required to show that offsets were considered as part of the decision to implement the project. Neither project met this test. In addition, both projects had baselines that were not properly determined. In April 2008, the Nature Conservancy of Canada purchased Darkwoods, a nearly 55,000 hectare property in southeastern BC. Darkwoods is an area of significant habitat for at least 19 species at risk, including grizzly bear and endangered mountain caribou. The carbon project was developed under the assumption that if the Nature Conservancy of Canada had not acquired the property, the most likely purchaser would have been a liquidation harvester with little regard for environmental protections. This became the hypothetical baseline scenario for the project. Under this scenario, the project expected to achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions by avoiding the release of carbon associated with aggressive logging practices. We found that the assumptions used were not conservative and this resulted in overestimating the emission reductions and overstating the carbon offsets generated by the project. As well, we found the Darkwoods baseline did not recognize the legal constraints imposed by the Federal EcoGift program on the project area. This graph highlights three potential baseline scenarios for the project, liquidation logging, sustained yield, and the historical practice. The project scenario represented the Nature Conservancy of Canada's actual forest management plan. The number of offsets generated from the Darkwoods project is the difference between the project scenario and the liquidation logging scenario. However, as previously noted, this scenario resulted in an overestimation of the emission reductions. We found limited support for the liquidation logging scenario. In this situation, an alternative buyer would follow unsustainable forestry practices. Our assessment is that the most likely purchaser would have been a logging company certified to one of three internationally recognized forest certifications and would follow sustainable forestry practices, such as those in the middle scenario, referred to as the sustained yield. However, in the end, we concluded that the Nature Conservancy of Canada had a legal constraint on what it could do with its property because the property was acquired in part utilizing the federal government's ecological gifts program. To stay within its legal obligations, the Nature Conservancy is restricted to the historical practice baseline scenario shown in the graph in order to prevent harm to the ecological values of darkwoods. The other project we looked at 
was the Incana Underbalanced Drilling Project, the project intended to result in emission reductions from reduced gas flaring. Gas was conserved through on-site recovery and capture, and then streamed directly into a pipeline, eliminating the need for flaring. The Emission Offsets Regulation requires proponents to consider financial implications during project evaluation. Because this project generated revenue from the sale of the captured gas, we expected Incana to have demonstrated how the project could not be considered business as usual. Good practice typically requires the proponent to do this by showing that the project is not the most financially attractive course of action. This was not done for this project. The Incana baseline was not supported by an appropriate test. Based on the preliminary information provided to the Pacific Carbon Trust on the project costs and gas recovery levels, the project was projected to be more economical than the historical practice of flaring the gas. The primary reason the financial analysis was not completed was because the Pacific Carbon Trust approved the protocol and it did not require financial aspects of the baseline to be considered. This protocol was approved despite the Pacific Carbon Trust not having authority to approve protocols. There were a number of opportunities for the government to have prevented these issues from happening. For example, although there is a regulatory framework for offset projects under the regulation, the language allows for considerable flexibility and we expected to find clear guidance in the key risk areas such as additionality and protocol development. Instead, we found draft guidance in these areas that is not required to be followed. As well, we found the Pacific Carbon Trust hired consultants to review key aspects of these projects. The consultants identified issues related to the project's credibility, but the Pacific Carbon Trust did not ensure these concerns were satisfactorily addressed before purchasing the offsets for these projects. Also, the Pacific Carbon Trust was dependent on these projects because the BC marketplace was still emerging in its capacity to deliver needed volumes. Lastly, we found that the Climate Action Secretariat did not provide the oversight we expected to ensure the offsets purchased on behalf of government are credible. Our third finding relates to our question about whether government is evaluating and reporting on the achievement of its objectives. In this regard, we found that government is reporting on its efforts to reduce emissions and its progress in achieving a carbon neutral government. With one year of comparable data available, we noted a 6% increase in emissions between 2010 and 2011. However, this increase in energy consumption has been attributed to overall colder temperatures in 2011. One area we have highlighted is that the reporting did not sufficiently address the risks facing public sector organizations in their continued work towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions. With regard to the Pacific Carbon Trust reporting on its offset portfolio, we found that the Pacific Carbon Trust has not provided sufficient information about the cost and quality of its purchases. An important aspect of transparent reporting is to demonstrate how funds spent on behalf of the public sector reflect good value for money. The Pacific Carbon Trust is restricted to purchasing offsets generated in BC. We found that they paid more than market rates for both projects. As a result of our audit, we made six recommendations. Number one, the Climate Action Secretariat work with public sector organizations to ensure each is pursuing reasonable actions to reduce emissions. As part of this, government should consider establishing public sector emission reduction targets. Number two, the Climate Action Secretariat ensure supplementary guidance to the emission offsets regulation be finalized and adhered to. Number three, the Pacific Carbon Trust to better manage offset purchase risks ensure that the results of its due diligence efforts are satisfactorily analyzed, concluded, and documented. Number four, the Climate Action Secretariat provides stronger oversight to ensure that the offsets purchased on behalf of government are credible. Number five, the Climate Action Secretariat and the Pacific Carbon Trust ensure that reporting on carbon neutrality assesses the trade-offs between reducing government emissions and offsetting those emissions through the purchase of offsets. Number six, the Pacific Carbon Trust provide greater transparency about the cost effectiveness of its purchases. That concludes our summary of this report. To read this report and other publications, 
or for more information about our office, please visit our website at www.bcauditor.com. The Office of the Auditor General encourages your feedback on this report, as well as your suggestions for future audits. We look forward to hearing from you.